let's give a, have a short recap. Uh, so protein protein interactions are physical protein interactions. We can see that when we look at the different twenty amino acids, four, three types of interactions differ. So if they differ, then we could in principle predict. Uh, there was this issue about statistical significance not being scientific significance and I believe this is another one for to distinguish between what is a correlation and what is a causation. Uh, I said that we can predict interfaces. This one here is the recall versus precision for the positives for the interacting sites and there's this tiny part here of blue. In fact that is as good as we can predict residues at the interface from sequence alone predict that they are involved in an external protein protein action. If we only use sequence as information. Uh, nothing else and this is a simple sort of machine learning device uh, and it does not continue here because it's ultimately that's where the model ends. So it reaches some level of performance that is better than random uh, for, for a very very small recall. For some residues it can predict, right? Uh, that is the, the model it does and by the way we, we dial through this curve here by essentially dialing through from strong to weak so both of these predictions are that this unit is predicting the protein protein interaction this is strong this is weak and in this curve we simply dial through this through this threshold uh, now as I said, it's better than random. This is the random background when we use evolutionary information. And again, evolutionary information comes from the fact that proteins evolve uh, in order to maintain, or when they evolve, then typically they maintain function because organisms have a lot of what they do is between us and the mouse is similar. So many of the proteins are the same, are very, very, are perform very similar functions. And that is why when you look at an alignment, so in a, in a superposition of related proteins from different species, you will see that where they are the same, those are important residues. Where they differ, those are less important residues. This is the signal you put into machine learning devices as a profile. This is what this one shows here. It's just the same model as uh, the same kind of neural network as before, except for you now put in this sort of more detailed information and then you move it from this light blue to this dark blue. Uh, so that's the type of improvement you get by just using. Uh, can get by using profiles or by using evolutionary information. Now we can predict hotspots. In fact, hotspots are simply in this model the ones that are most strongly predicted. If I take them and use them to predict hotspots, then I'm doing remarkably well. Uh, okay, so on next Tuesday, I will talk about how protein interactions happen in terms of pairing. Can we predict whether two proteins pair? Today I want to get into another theme of protein interactions, which is in fact protein nucleotides. So the one thing that protein nucleotides have in common with protein-protein interaction is, remember for protein-protein interaction I showed you that in the number of adjacent, sequence adjacent residues, so I ask for nine adjacent residues, how many of the ones in this window of nine adjacent residues are in a binding site? And if I define the binding site as they are less than six angstrom apart, uh, blue here, then you see that mostly, so the majority of the plot here is about six to seven, so in every window of nine where one residue is in a binding site, on every six or seven on a binding site, so it is a feature, protein-protein binding, it is a feature that extends to your sequence neighborhood, which is not necessarily trivial, or it's not at all trivial, because remember, proteins act as three-dimensional objects, and three-dimensional objects, so these three points here, they would not be close in terms of sequence. Because these loops underneath, or these, these things underneath here, are making this part of the sequence, let's call it I and J, be very diff distant. Or could at least make it distant. And again, uh, this is the kind of scenario that we have for enzymatic activity. This is the kind of scenario that we have for metal binding. In fact, this is the kind of scenario that we have for sugar binding. We have this type of scenario for almost all small molecule binding sites. Large molecule binding sites, protein protein interaction, 
proteins are large molecules, uh, because they have many atoms compared to, to a simple sugar, the large molecule binding sites obviously span a little bit more on the sequence, so somehow they look more like this here. So their sequence adjacent I and J now are close in the neighborhood and they both bind. And that's what you see in this plot. And the other feature or the other thing that, that binds to proteins that very, is very important that has a similar feature is DNA or RNA. Uh, so let me give you the background of the, the DNA again. You have Many of you may have seen this, this typical double helix. Uh, the double helix has some sort of structure. There's a, ma a minor groove and a major groove, so a bigger hole and a smaller hole, so to speak. And this is one way in which prote a protein can bind, the, the lumbar repressor, uh, repressor protein here, uh, where you see different units from the protein going into the major groove at different points. The protein hangs together, and essentially you have three, in this particular case you have like, like a cl clamp binding into it. Uh, here in the nucleosome you have, in, uh, in the histidone, histidone uh, we have the way where the DNA actually wraps around a protein product. So this is in fact the way it's done here. Uh, the histones, the wrapping around the, the DNA, run, wrapping around the histones, this is the way DNA is actually stored in the cell. Okay, uh, And this is the way epigenetics happen. Because, in fact, the, uh, this, this, this way of forming here uh, has an influence that you can, in your lifetime, change, it seems. Okay, here are two other examples uh, in the leucine zipper. Again, you now have long fingers that, that sort of grab, uh, like a pincer, the DNA from two different sites. They're all uh, motifs, and all of these, what they have in common is a long the, the interaction site is local in terms of sequence, so adjacent residues are involved. Uh, so, how many proteins bind DNA? In fact, the answer, uh, when I first brought this up, was not clear. Uh, today is still not quite clear, but to, uh, people now believe that there are about 1600 transcription factors. Transcription factors are those that make the turn essentially help when it is about turning DNA into proteins. Those are the regulators in the human genome. 1600 a large number. Do you remember how many proteins we have in human? 28,000. So is that a lot? No, less than 10%. Well, 10%, but now imagine you have 10% for control, right? So, uh, if we believe that a lot of the complexity of, the, of, of human has to do with alternative control, then a lot of that alternative control happens in these 1600. And another way of putting it, we assume that we have 20,000 proteins, we assume that on average about 12,000 are on in a particular cell type. So if, if you imagine that we have about 200 different cell types and they have slightly different proteins that are switched on because they have to do slightly different things and they have a slightly different uh, set of proteins used to different things. It's not the 20,000 that are switched on in every cell. Um, in fact, neuro, neurons are the ones that have the highest number of, of proteins switched on and even they are sort of getting to 14,000, uh, a little bit, 14,000, 15,000. But no cell type has, has more than that in, in human. Uh, now, the assumption is that about 8,000 proteins are similar in different cell types. So they are on, they are sort of the housekeeping enzymes. That is just for the background cellular processes you need these 8,000 roughly, uh, or a number close to 8,000. Now that gives you some idea. So the speciality of a particular cell type then, so 8,000 is sort of the, the background, 12,000 is the, what, what you have on average, so 4,000 are sort of specialized, right? But another way of looking at it is these sort of 1,600 in this, in this, in this number framework is a fairly large number, actually, suddenly. Um, anyway, we still, bless you, we still don't quite know how many proteins actually bind DNA or RNA. Uh, but we can predict it from motifs. And one simple way of predicting from motifs is the nuclear localization signal. 
I'll bring that back. Uh, so the one that I said is recognized to import proteins into a, a cell and then most proteins in the cell bind DNA. So they bind DNA with the same signal or some of these bind it with the same signal and here's an example of a, a, a label of a nuclear localization signal and the DNA binding. So you see that actually the nuclear localization signal is exactly the site that binds the DNA. And it's a, it's a very clever mechanism that works. So this is one way in which you can define DNA binding sites by simply looking at the subset of nuclear localization signals that bind DNA. Right? It's the simplest way. Uh, now, so, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, the, um, the be so we, we, what I'm going to present now is a method that we developed to predict DNA binding sites. Uh, and we essentially, uh, Trevor, Trevor was involved at Yanai Ofran, uh, Venkata Mysore. Um, and the problem really was how do I, f how do I define <coughs> the interaction site? So where do I get my data set from? And the best way to start, of course, is the PDB. Downside is you don't have that many, but upside you have very, very good data. Uh, and the question then becomes, what is a DNA binding site? And typically, well, how would you define that? So given your experience with protein-protein with binding sites, how would you define a DNA binding site? So this is it. Let, let's just assume that we move now from the example where this was a protein binding site. Now this is sort of DNA binding site here. Uh, the red one is a DNA binding site. How would you define the residues that bind DNA? Do you have the 3D structure? What would you look for? Yeah? The distance again? Yeah. Now, the problem, so we would simply say, well, if a particular amino acid is within, say, 6 angstrom, or 0.6 nanometer <coughs> uh, of a nucleotide, then I call it binding. One issue is that DNA protein binding is even more dynamic uh, than protein protein binding. So these sites, if I measure that three times or two times, I will not always get the same residues involved in the binding site. Uh, although these motifs that I showed you are very clear, uh, that is sort of a, a problem that I see with the structures we have. That has also to do with the fact that it's not that easy to get these structures, ultimately. So that implies that ideally we would maybe do another step. Another way of looking at it is we would compute the energy. So we would look at the residues that are close and contribute to the energy of binding. DNA is uh, negatively charged, so we actually also would care in this particular case if we had a positively charged residue that is sitting here, maybe slightly too far for calling it an interaction site, but for electrostatic interaction it may still suffice, it may still be close enough to actually affect the DNA. Right? In that sense it would be a binding site in the sense that it is necessary to bind the DNA not in the sense that it actually touches it. Okay? Uh, and for DNA, our understanding of the, the energy of binding is, is much simpler than for, because DNA is a relatively simple molecule, uh, much simpler than, than for proteins, and we can really compute that, and that is the work here of Tra Trevor Siggers with programs from, from Barry Honig's group, uh, that gave us a data set uh, with about 250 uh, chains binding DNA from 290 complexes and with this we sort of got a relatively no, an immensely good method uh, on a per residue prediction accuracy uh, so per residue is here per protein is even more impressive uh, you see differentiation between a simple neural network and SVM and a combination of a neural network and an SVM now it turns out, uh, Jean Jou will show you some data that suggests that this is an absolute overestimate. Uh, and the overestimate we believe, so this is the protein protein view, so one thing for instance to, to state here, for almost 50% of all the proteins we make no mistake. Uh, and 
there are two issues that we encountered in this. The first one is in our data set we never really had non-binding proteins. Come in. Uh, I just need a little bit more, uh, longer. Uh, so that was one reason why, why this m overestimate happened. Another reason, it as it turned out, and that is sort of more relevant in this context here of machine learning, is that what we did when we selected for residues that are close and that have a high energy or contribute to the energy of binding is we selected a data set that was very clean. And the problem with a very clean data set is simply that it sort of gives you something that is simple to distinguish by machine learning from a, so I have essentially have two data sets one very clean this binds and one very clean that this doesn't bind and the cleaner your data sets the simpler the machine learning becomes which in fact is something that you typically want to do however if the problem the biophysics of binding the actual problem underneath were more complicated than that meaning that it may bind or not depending on environmental effects for instance that you don't see in there right then you would sort of put that under the carpet because you would never see those data and the way you prepare your training data of false po uh, for, for uh, right and wrong or bind and not bind you would never see those sort of ambi uh, ambiguous cases uh, and that is another important problem here so JJ is going to show you some some data uh, some more recent data uh, where that, that I believe contains a lot more of these ambiguous cases and these estimates here are way different uh, I can't remember do you have do you have 10 percent way way this is on the per on the per protein level for DNA binding do you remember for how many do you make no mistake for how many proteins uh, so essentially this is 100 percent right right for 50 percent for the top 50 percent uh, we we have we can distinguish a protein from a binding DNA binding protein from non-binding protein without any mistake uh, you can do that for your top five percent or top 10 we will see um, anyway uh, now uh, one one of the things that you then have to do and uh, with that method that I showed you we went on and simply asked well now I have a DNA prediction method how many proteins do I predict DNA for that were previously not known uh, so in some sense this is the part uh, for which we have binding motifs uh, for different organisms here and uh, then we simply ask how much can we add and you can see that the green is the part where we sort of predicted it the red is the part where we could have before the method was developed have known it and you see that for different organisms here uh, unfortunately the uh, axis no longer shows the organism uh, but you see that in most cases what is added by the method is way 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 more than what was existing at the time um, okay, now I'm talking about next generation uh, and I'm talking about issues, but I believe uh, so this will also not be part of the exam because I'm going through it way too fast. Uh, there is the story of RNA. RNA is similar to, to DNA, is, a, is much more flexible. And because it's much more flexible, uh, finding the binding sites is more complicated. Uh, here is a, an image of a ribosome uh, in which you have a lot of uh, RNA in there that has sort of enzymatic activity. And in fact, that's another issue of RNA versus DNA. RNA has enzymatic activity, DNA doesn't. Uh, and I believe I, I give it over to, to you, uh, Jean-Jou. Um, 